Well, good morning and welcome to South Point where we're one church in multiple locations. I want to say good morning Ed, to our Leonard Down campus. Is anyone excited to be here this morning? This middle row, you're doing great. The ends have more coffee and donuts. We want to say good morning to our Lesby campus. We're so glad that you're here with us. My name is Matt. I'm part of the team. Hey, we're in our last week of our series called Double. And the reason that we named the series Double is because often in life there feels like there's two of us, right? I mean, there's we've put this up every week for the last five or six weeks. And here's what we said. There's a me I want to be. Raise your hand if there's a me you want to be. There's a, um, I promise it's coming. There's a slide coming that says there's a me I want to be. And then there's a me that I am. And have you ever noticed that sometimes there's the me that I am and the me that I want to be, that there's a difference? Just nod your head out in the audience if that's ever happened to you. There's a a me you wanted to be, and then there's a me you are, and they were different. Now, I want to do a little bit of recap before we dive in. And in week one, uh, we discovered this truth that, listen, church should never be a morality fashion show. Listen, when you and I come here, it's not to dress up and put on a smile and try to look as good as morally as we can to each other. Church should never be a morality fashion show. Church should be a place where you and I can come where we can admit our struggles, and then you and I can take steps alongside with Jesus to become the me that we were meant to be. And then we too, we discovered the reason. And here's the reason. The reason for our double is we have default settings that are defective. Listen, at the end of the day, our default settings are me, myself, and I. And when my default setting of me, myself, and I, and your default setting of me, myself, and I, and that rubs together, it creates the chaos in the world. And we discovered in week two that we don't have the power to overcome that, but God does. And then in week three, we discovered God's power is present, and God often shows up in our lives to other people. We talked about, listen, this is why it's so important to be in community. This is why it's so important to get in in groups, like maybe celebrate recovery if you have addictions or hurts or habits. This is why we have small groups. That's why we have small groups all over in this side of the county and the other side of the county is because God often shows up in our lives through other people. And then last week we discovered this truth, that our input will always impact the result of our output. Listen, for you and I to become the me that we want to be, we need to add God's thoughts so we can become who he made us to be. And here's the great news. Listen. If you've missed any of our messages, you can go onto our website, the videos are there, you can go to our YouTube channel, and you can watch and you can catch up um, in our series called Double. But I saved the best for last. How many of you have ever done that? Like you saved the best thing on your plate or the dessert for last, you can kind of finish with something that's really good. And I saved, I think, kind of one of the best parts of this message for last. And here's why, because listen, in becoming the me I want to be, There is a trap, and it is one of the biggest traps that all of us fall into when it comes to becoming the me I want to be. And here's what I've discovered about traps. Listen, if you've ever been in a speed trap, if you've ever been in any kind of trap, if you've ever trapped an animal, listen, traps are painful and traps are costly. That's why none of us ever want to be in a trap because they are painful and they are costly. And listen, when it comes to becoming the me that I want to be, Many of us, myself included, will often fall into this very big trap. And I was recently reminded of this trap. Matter of fact, it happened about two weeks ago. I was reading a book summary, and it was a book summary um, called The Slight Edge. And this, this book summary was about how do you make decisions, how do you live a disciplined life so that you can become the, the me you want to be. And when I saw these words on a page, I literally put my, the, the book um, thing down. I grabbed my journal, and I started to write because I'm telling you, this statement that this guy wrote in The Slight Edge, he's not a Christian. It's just a regular business book. He wrote this phrase, and I said, that describes the biggest trap that Christ followers or even people who are trying to become them they want to be fall into and he put into words and I had to stop and I wrote it in my journal and I just stopped and said wow that is amazing and so this morning I want to share a quote with you from the book The Slight Edge and here it is it says people myself included probably you and other people people are looking for the winning lottery ticket in a game that's not a lottery smile He says, listen, people are looking for the winning lottery ticket in a game that's not a lottery. He goes on to say, he says it like this. He says, people are looking for a quantum leap. They are looking for this one thing that will take them from where they are to where they want to be so that they will have arrived and it will be smooth sailing. And he says, people are looking for this lottery ticket, but they're not in the game of a lottery. 
And he describes what our biggest problem is when it comes to becoming the me that I want to be. He describes in these few words what the biggest trap is. Is that you and I are often looking for that one thing. That one experience. That one thought. That one event. I'll be happy when I'm dating. My life will be all complete when I get married and married people chuckled in the audience. My life will be complete when I have a house. You know, it'll be complete when I have kids. It'll be complete when the kids leave. You know, it'll be complete when I retire. We keep looking for that one thing, that one thought, that one event that will move us from where we are to where we want to be. And then we'll have finally arrived. We'll finally arrived and we won't experience trouble and heartache and all the things will work and we'll have arrived. And it sounds so good, doesn't it? But there's one problem. It's just not true. It's what the author's trying to tell you. If you are looking for that one event, that one thought, that one thing that will get you from where you are in one quantum leap and you'll never have difficulties, you never have to have discipline, you are in the wrong game. Now listen, I don't, I don't want anyone here to be like, listen, you mean, is change possible? Change is absolutely possible. Change is absolutely possible. I'm not going to put this phrase up on the thing as I was thinking about. Listen, our hearts can change in an instant. Maybe you, you maybe like for me, like when I first met my wife, my heart changed in an instant. Our habits are changed over time. See, nobody likes that. We're all like, I don't know if I want to come today. Listen, our hearts can be changed. Listen, it is absolutely true that when you and I finally understand that God is for you, because listen, if anyone would die for you, they are for you. When you realize that whatever it is, that worst thing that you did, that moment that you sinned, the moment you turned your back on God, that God loved you, that God forgave you, in Christ, God can't love you anymore, and that your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins are forgiven because of, not because you showed up or not because you did things, but because God loves you and Jesus paid the price on the cross and he conquered hell and death. That can melt our heart in an instant. However, our habits are changed over time. And here's why our habits are changed over time. It's because this default setting of me, myself, and I, we've built all these things in a lifetime of years and years of practice. And those don't change an instant. And so I wanted to kind of explain. I'm going to put a little picture up here. I made this picture. It's not a very good picture, but it's a simple picture. Can you nod your head if it's a simple picture? A simple picture, right? Because I think, you know, our life is a lot like a computer. And here's what I mean is we have this computer. We have this body and it's our, our kind of our hardware. And then we have a soul, and that's kind of our software, right? And our default setting is me, myself, and I in our hearts, me, myself, and our body, right? But then when God comes in and we receive Jesus and we say yes to him, and not just yes, I want to get to heaven, but yes, he'll be the Lord of our life. And will follow him, something happens and our heart changes in an instant. It's like the software of our soul got rewritten. We are no longer me, myself, and I in control. That's why they call him Jesus, who's not only our Savior, but our Lord. He comes and lives in our hearts. We have this new software, and we're all fired up. We're like, woo. The problem is, is this new software is surrounded by this old hardware, and some of us have older hardware than others. Just smile. But this hardware has me, myself, and I built into it. And so though we have this new software, we often are in conflict because the hardware, our flesh, this body, this suit, our habits, over years have developed for me, myself, and I. So our heart can change in an instant, but man, those habits, they change over time. And the trap that we fall into is that we hope that there's one event, one thought, and one thing that somehow will magically remove this process or remove this process from us, that we'll have to avoid, we'll get to avoid it. I'm special. I found the secret. Which leads me to our opening truth. If you're following along, and sir, we're going to put it up on the screen here, and it goes like this. Listen, chasing a one-and-done experience is a trap that leads to failure, and it leads to heartache. I call it the three Ds. You will be disappointed. I promise you, you can read the next book. You can go to the next seminar. You can go to the best church. You can go to whatever it is. And here's the problem. When you and I hope for this one and done thing that we chase after, and then we experience daily difficulties or daily discipline, we become disappointed. 
And then on top of that, after we're disappointed, we become disenchanted. Here's why. Because sometimes we keep chasing these events or these thoughts or these ideas, hoping for this one-done thing that changes us magically. And we feel like God's an adult. Have you ever met those adults? They play games with kids, but they never let kids win. You ever seen the adult that like tries to do this with a kid and always wins? And you just want to punch him. You're like, man, let the little kid win. But that's how we feel about God. When we go chasing the one and done, we feel like God's the mean adult who's hiding this thing from us. And we become upset with God. We become disenchanted. And then our growth derails. Because when you and I chase the one and done that doesn't exist, here's the saddest part. You and I stay stuck. And it got me thinking. That's why I saved it for the last. I mean, does anyone here who wants to become the me that I want to be, the me that God made me to be, do any of us really want to experience disappointment or disenchantment or being derailed and staying stuck? And the answer for most smart, sane people is no. And so we're left asking a very, very important question this morning. How do you and I not get stuck in a trap of the one and done that is so easy to fall into. And this is why I get fired up for Sundays, is we're not the first generation, we're not the first people group to deal with this. God in his wisdom, he understood that people like you and I, that this would be something that we could fall for. He knew it'd be a trap. And so God had one of his most influential disciples, a guy named the Apostle Paul. And what's amazing about the Apostle Paul is he was literally amazing. He encountered a risen Jesus. He went all across the world and planted churches. He wrote about 25% of the New Testament. And this Apostle Paul actually addresses this kind of idea of chasing the one and done. Matter of fact, he wrote a letter to a church in, in Rome. It's, the letter's called Romans, but it was a church a lot like us. There were, there were some Jewish, and there were some heathen, and there were some free people, and some poor people. And, and there were slaves, and there were women, and there were children. It was just kind of a hodgepodge of group. But they were trying to follow this one named Jesus. And he wrote this letter. We're going to pick it up in Romans 8. <coughs> He says, for we know that even the things of nature, like animals and plants, suffer in the sickness of death as they await this great event, that great event that Jesus is going to come back. And he goes on to say that even we Christians, although we have the Holy Spirit, God's presence within us, as a foretaste of future glory, also grown to be released from pain and suffering. Now, I want to stop right there. He says, listen, you and I can look around the world, the physical world, We can read the news and see what's going on. We can look at our own bodies and we can realize that there's brokenness on the outside of the world and we have this hardware that is failing us that doesn't work the way that we want it to. And we would love for it to just work the way it was supposed to. And he says... He says, listen, I get this. God is is letting you know. He sees this. This This was true then. This is true now. But he doesn't leave us there. He goes on to say this. We too wait anxiously for that day when God will give us our full rights as children. And then he goes on and says, including the new bodies he's promised, bodies that will never again be sick and never die. And then he concludes and goes on and says this, we are saved by trusting. And trusting means looking forward to getting something we don't have. Something we don't yet have. You see, Jesus in his Death and his burial and his resurrection accomplished perfection, except you and I haven't had that perfection enacted. And so what do we do? We have to trust. We have to hope. And he goes on to say this, for a man who already has something, he something doesn't need to hope and trust that he will get it. But if we must keep on trusting God for something that hasn't happened, it teaches us to wait patiently and confidently. We all want to arrive We all want to arrive. But listen, here's what I've discovered. There is only one and done event that causes you to arrive. And it's not good. Can can you can you guess what it is? Death. I mean, if you want to finally arrive and never have to have discipline, if you want to arrive and never actually have to have difficulty in your life, the only way to do it is to die. And he says, this is why we we wait patiently, because anybody who has what they want, they don't need to hope or trust. 
And he says, we must wait patiently, which leads to my opening observation. If you're one of those type A people, you always got to fill in the insert. And if I ever miss one, it's on the back, so don't cheat. But I'm going to give it to you. Here's observation number one. Change happens when we admit. Listen, you and I will never become the me that we want to be until we're willing to admit. In life, there is no single event. There's no, there's, there's no single event. There, there's not going to be like this one magical moment where you never sin again, you never are not tempted, you never have to deal with difficulty, that somehow you will magically be awesome and everything will go smoothly for the rest. Like that doesn't exist. There's no single event that exempts us from daily discipline and difficulties. Now, this is why I want to stop here for a second. I don't want to. This is why I love Jesus. You see, Jesus never told a lie to gain followers. Because when you lie to gain followers, you're not really for them, you're for yourself. You see, Jesus told the truth because he loves us. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus never lied to people who said, in this world, you will have trouble. He says, listen, there's not going to be a single event that exempts you from daily discipline and difficulties. God is not a magical genie that you get to rub to say, I want the parking spot. I want to rub my Bible and get the promotion. I want to rub the Bible and say, God, I want to be removed from temptation. Like that doesn't exist. And if you are looking for the winning lottery ticket to get a pass, you're in the wrong game. None of us are exempt from life's challenges. Jesus wasn't exempt from life's challenges. And this is hard to say, and you won't like it, but if I love you, I'm going to tell you the truth. Character is not developed in a moment. Character is developed in time. So the first thing to becoming the me I want to be is that we have to admit before we can change. I'll never forget, I was in... Probably my early 20s, maybe, I, I forget what age it was, and I had this friend come up to me, and they said, hey, Matt, you know, what you're doing is not, not really working. And I said, what are you talking about? They go, hey, man, like, I'm your friend, and good friends always tell you the truth. And said, man, what you're doing isn't working. And I said, I'm surprised by that, because what I've been doing seems to be working. And they go, I don't think it's working as well as you think it's working. And I said, listen, man, like, this has worked for a while. Like, I should keep going. And they're like, no, you shouldn't. And so I want to show you a picture of what they were addressing. <laughs> hey, any of you remember the mullet? That's me. You know, business in the front and party in the back, right? Anybody remember that? Like, I tried to wear this into the early 90s before someone said to me, like, bro, you have to stop that. That isn't working. I don't ever know why I even had a mullet in the first place. Somebody should have just slapped me, right? Like, why would you ever use that hairstyle? But that's what I did. And before I could change, I had to. We can move on from that picture, please. You don't need to leave that bad boy. Move it, please. We don't need to leave that bad boy up. Anyway, I was like, man, and before you can change, you need to admit. And so I think one of the very first things that the scripture told us is, that we wait patiently for something we don't have yet. Perfection is coming, but in this lifetime, we need discipline and we will have difficulties, and you and I will never become the me I was meant to be unless we admit that there is no single event, thought, or thing that gets us from here to there. Well, if we admit, then what's kind of the next step? How do we actually move forward? How do we actually become the me I want to be? And what's amazing is, is we believe there's this letter to a church. Um, it was in Jerusalem. It was to a Jewish church. And we believe the same guy, the Apostle Paul, wrote the letter. And he's, he's writing to a group of Christians. And he says, listen, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge witness to the life of faith. And he's saying, listen, there have been people who've gone before us who followed after God. And because of how they've lived, we can take a look at them. And he goes on to say this. He says, and I promise it's moving. It's going. There you go. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially that the sin that so easily trips us. He says, listen, as you and I go through life, we can get tripped up. We can get tangled. And he goes on to say, and let us run with, what's the word? Like, there's some patience that's required. Like, you don't get there in one shot. You don't get there in one leap. This is, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. We do this by keeping our eyes on now listen, this is where I'm going to stop and get on my soapbox. So if you, you may be offended, so I don't know if you want to listen to that. So we call these buckle-up moments at South Point. Okay. Like, listen, it doesn't say keep your eyes on politics. 
you're going to be disappointed. It doesn't say keep your eyes on money. It doesn't say keep your eyes on your spouse, your grandma, your mama, your pastor, the government. It says keep your eyes on Keep your eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. As he goes on, he says this. He says, because of the joy awaiting him, he, Jesus, endured the cross and disregarded its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. He says, listen, as you go through life, you're going to get tangled. You're going to get tripped, and you need to try to avoid those things. You're going to need endurance. In the end, he says, listen, Jesus endured the cross. Even Jesus wasn't relieved of difficulties and hardships. So how do we do that? And he says, listen, we do it by fixing our eyes not on what, but on a who, and his name is Jesus. Which leads me to observation number two, which is this. Focus, it's coming, change happens when we focus on Jesus. Religious acts are never a substitute for how we relate to God and other people. Now listen, everyone, everyone, everyone look up here, because this is gonna, this is, I need you to like, kind of like turn your ear and be in. See, there's something about humanity, and myself included. We like religious acts to make up for the things that we don't do. I mean, think about it. We, we think maybe if I go to church, maybe if I read my Bible, maybe if I wear a WWJD bracelet, maybe if I listen to the Christian radio station, maybe if I like serve at a homeless shelter or serve food at the, at the pantry or, or maybe I put something in the offering, we think those are religious acts that will make up for our failures. And Jesus, Jesus never said that. There is no substitute. Jesus said, the whole law is summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then love your neighbors yourself. That all the law hangs on that. And literally, there are no religious acts that are a substitute for how we relate to God and people. And what we need to understand is, listen, our relationship with Jesus defines how we relate to everything else around us. Listen, if you leave church and you go treat someone like trash, Coming to church is no substitute for rightly relating. And that's why our focus isn't on coming to church or Christian books or, you know, or, you know reading or, or those things. And we should do all those things. All those things are good things. But they're, they're not a substitute for Jesus being the defining relationship that defines how we relate to everything else. Um, I was trying to think of, like, what would be a good example of Jesus being a defining relationship? Um, and I had this example. As a matter of fact, it happened last week. I had some friends who invited me out for some wings. And you just need to understand something. I love some wings. And they were going to my favorite place. And, um, you know, I'll even mention it. It's the pub in Leonardtown. They have the best wings on Monday. It's 50 Cent Wing Night. And, mm. I'm just, oh, that's so good. So my friend said, hey, we're going to go to the pub. Let's get some wings. I said, I'm in, right? But here's the thing. I forgot to tell my wife. And so I got home to, like, change. Um, and as I walked in, dinner was made. And she says, are you ready to eat? Now, at this moment, I had a choice. I could make my friends happy. Or I can make my spouse happy. And here's, like, listen, listen, listen. Here's what I discovered. When I said yes to my wife outside of Jesus, she became one of the most important defining relationships in my life. Amen. And so what happened is, is I said I can make my wife sad or hurt because I'm not going to eat. Or I can make my friends sad or hurt that I could not eat. Or I could eat both. <laughs> I didn't eat both. Anyway. So I, so I texted my friends and said, hey, man, I forgot to tell my wife I'm going to be late and I'm, I'm going to eat here. And so I ate at home because my relationship with my wife is my number one. That relationship defines how I relate to, to mostly every other person outside of Jesus. And so that defines that. And that's how our relationship. And so change happens when we focus on a who. His name is Jesus. N not a what? A Jesus. So now, what does this look like in practice? And here's what I love. God doesn't leave you and I guessing on what this looks like in practice. Matter of fact, we see this in a letter to a church in Corinth. It's actually by the Apostle Paul again, and he writes this. He says, in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. You know that, don't you? So run in a way that you will get a prize. And I love how it says you, because it's not like God's going to smack you or hit you with a lightning bolt or God's going to do your job for you. You have to do something. And then he goes on to say this. He says, all who take part in the games try Oh, I got that wrong. All those who are in a game, what? Train. Train hard. They do not get it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And then he goes on to say, so I do not run like someone who doesn't run towards the finish line. 
He says, listen, I get it. There'll be a day where I'm going to stand before the creator of the universe who gave his one and only son, and I'm going to be accountable, and and I'm going to be responsible for the life I've given me. So I I don't want to run aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer who hits nothing but the air. No, I, my body, and bring it under control. Then after I've preached to others, I myself do not break the rules. If I did break them, I would fail to win the prize. He's saying, listen. Trying isn't enough. We need to train, which leads me to observation number three is change happens when we train. Do by training what we can't do by trying. Listen. Hey, so listen, and, and there are probably a couple of you like really awesome, like really fit people here. Like if I said, hey, your life depended on it, go run a marathon, most of us would be dead, right? Myself included. But if I said, listen, In a year, all of us have to run a marathon. You could do in training what you couldn't do by trying. And see, here's something I discovered, and this is true. Here's what I discovered. Sometimes we don't fail because of our want to. We fail because of the how to. Oh, y'all missed that one. Sometimes we don't fail because of our want to. Sometimes we fail because of our how to. We have the want to. We just don't know how to. And I had this person's example a couple weeks ago. Um, I was coming back from church, and I drove into the driveway, and my wife came in right behind me. And, and, but my girls parked down at the driveway, and I go, what's going on? She goes, on the girl's car, their brake light's out, so I'm going to take them to AutoZone, and we're going to replace the taillight. And I thought, awesome. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I thought that was really great. So they drove to AutoZone, and then they come back, and I said, how'd it go? Did you guys get it done? They go, no. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, we don't know how to do this. And they brought me the bulb and they handed it to me. And she says, can you do it? And I said, great. And so I took my two daughters and I said, listen, I know you don't know how to do this. And so it didn't matter that they tried. They looked at it. They, they just were like, I don't know how to do this. It isn't because they didn't want to change the bulb. It's they didn't know how to. And sometimes it's not a want to, it's a how to. So I walked about and said, you open the trunk. Boop. And you see these little, these little like things, you just pop them off, pop. And then you just turn and pull the bulb out, look. And then you don't touch it with your hands because your hands got oil and the bulb won't last as long. So you use a little cloth and put it in, stick it in. And it worked. And they were like, woo, that was easy. And now they knew how to change a taillight in their car. Even though they tried, they couldn't do it because they didn't know how. But when they got trained, they were able to do what they couldn't do before. And it leaves me thinking, I wonder how many of us are trying versus training. And so this morning, I want to try to do something very, very practical, okay? So this is going to be really practical. We've hit some biblical stuff. I've given you some principles, but I don't want to just walk away with some principles. I want you to walk away with some how-tos. And so I want to ask a real simple question. How do you and I change habits? How do you and I change certain habits that we know don't make Jesus smile? They don't help us become the me I want to be, and yet they're robbing from our lives. And so I want to give you a little bit of just like how habits work. It's called the habit loop. And so I'm going to put up on here, and it's coming. I promise we're going to put up here. It's the habit loops, okay? It's the habit loop. And this is kind of like a sociological research thing. This is kind of how it works, is that all of you and I have a cue or a trigger. And say, and I use kind of a, like a kind of like strong example here, but say you have a cue or a trigger of being frustrated. You're, you know, your boss yelled at you, your kids screamed, you know, your, your spouse, you only got in a fight, you, you lo- like something happened and you're really frustrated. And so a habit comes as you create a routine and the routine might be like smoking cigarettes or, you know, sometimes other things, right? And um, we're just, we're just being honest. That's okay. We can smile at the church. It's a place where you can admit and struggle and take steps, right? So you get frustrated, right? Your routine is to smoke. And why do you smoke? Because smoking releases dopamine or gives you a reward in your brain and you don't feel frustrated anymore. And and that's how you start a habit. You have a cue or a trigger. Then you pick a routine to help you not feel that, to feel better, to, to give some kind of reward. And that's how our habits get ingrained. And habits are changed over because they're built up over. And so what happens is, and this is, I'm going to, and we're going to go to the next slide because I'm going to show a bunch. There's a bunch of cues. There's frustrated, stressed, insecure, hurt, lonely, underappreciated, disappointed. And, he, and come on, no, this is, no, I need everyone like, this is where you're just going to, you want to look at the screen or look at me, All right, okay. See, this is where we get it wrong. See, here's what we want. We want God to be our magic genie who will erase all these things. We go, God, I want a pass from all these things. And if you give me a pass from all these things, I will no longer do any of these things. 
but that's not how life works. Jesus says that's not how life works. And so we can't erase the cues. And then for many of us, we just go, listen, I'm going to try not to do this. How many of you said, I'm going to try? It's not a trick question. Harder. I'm not going to try. Har- Again, not a trick question. Harder. I'm going to try. Right? How many of us have said, I'm going to try harder? The problem is you can't try to do these things. We have to train. So we can't erase these, but we need to replace these. Whether it's smoking or outburst of anger, whether it's binge eating or gossip or porn or shopping or binging media. We do all those things when we experience these cues of frustrated, stressed, insecure, hurt, lonely, underappreciated, disappointed. And we do these things and they become a routine because they give us pleasure, relief, and escape. Except that when we're done, we feel guilt and shame and they ruin our lives. And then what we do, we created these feelings back over here, and what does it create? And so what we do is we have to replace these. And I gave us some ideas of some things that we can replace. We can use gratitude. Maybe at the start of every day, you can write down three things that you're grateful for. Matter of fact, maybe if you're frustrated, something's going, you just go, what is one thing I'm grateful for? Maybe you could exercise. Scientists said one of the greatest things that you can do to rewire your brain is to exercise. It gives you the best stimulus for, your, for the neurotransmitters in your brain. And not only is it great for your brain, it actually helps you live longer. Anyway, pray. Get in a group of other people. I mean, we have this awesome thing called Celebrate Recovery. If you ever hurt a habit or hang up, You need to be around some other people who are willing to admit and willing to take steps to get better. Don't do it by yourself. Read the Bible. Forgive. If you're going to do something stupid, pause and breathe. Because instead of release or escape or pleasure, you and I can find satisfaction and peace and joy. Which leads me to kind of the summation of this this whole point of what the Scripture has been telling us, which is this. Just stopping it doesn't work. We need God to be present in our life. And God is often present through other people. And we need to add God's thoughts. Just stopping it doesn't work. So we need to replace, not erase. Listen, you and I are not going to erase the difficulties of life. And here's the reality. You and I cannot erase the fact that we need daily discipline. But we can replace the routines that lead to things that we don't want. So as I lay on this plane, close this series, I had a meeting this week with a very courageous person, and they were telling me their story, and it was one of the stories that when you hear it, your heart breaks, right? And I looked at this person, and I said, listen, you didn't get, you got, you had a bad hand dealt to you. That, that wasn't right, wasn't good. Everything about that was wrong. Here's the thing. You can never go back and change the past. But here's great news. No matter what our past is, Jesus can forgive us. Jesus can heal us. That's the great thing about Jesus conquering hell and death is that my future, my present, your future, your present doesn't have to be defined by what happened in the past. Instead, it can be defined by what Christ did. And as I looked at this person, I said, I want you to know no matter where you are in the present, Jesus is willing to be with you. And for many of us, when we come to church, we don't believe Jesus is willing to be with us. Is Jesus willing to be with me in my bankruptcy? Is Jesus willing to be with me in my addiction? Is Jesus willing to be with me in my divorce? Is Jesus willing to be with me in my court cases? Is Jesus willing to be with me in my pornography habits? Is Jesus willing to be with me in my bustedness, my brokenness? And Jesus is always willing to meet you right where you are. You don't have to clean yourself up. Jesus will meet you wherever you are in the present. And then it gets better. This is why we should be the most fired up people on the planet. This is why you should come to church with a smile on your face. It's because, listen, our past doesn't have to define us. And if Jesus is willing to be with us in our present, no matter what our present looks like, our future can be different and be changed. We can't change the past, but we sure can change with Jesus what our future looks like. I know this. 
As someone who struggled with drug addiction and who was locked up as a young man, who they told me I would never see life out of the four walls of a prison or alive, but they didn't know Jesus. Because when Jesus stepped into my life, my future has changed. And here's the great thing. I'm not all the me I want to be yet, but I know with Jesus being present in my every day that I will eventually get to where Jesus wants me to be. So I want to leave you with one of the most important questions. Because every January, people all around the world are thinking about, how am I going to become the me I want to be? And I want to ask, how? How are you going to become the me you want to be? Because whoever it is that you look to for the ability to become that person will determine your success. And I just want to ask, is it you? Is it someone else? Or will it be Jesus? Because how we answer that will be the most important answer we ever make. Let me pray. Hey, God, I'm amazed at your grace that no matter what we've done in the past and no matter where we are in the present and no matter what missteps we may make in the future, Jesus paid for it all. And you're willing to be present to step in our lives, that you love us, that you are for us. Anyone that would die for us is for us. But God, you won't do it for us. You require us to partner with you. God, may we say yes. May our hope not be in ourselves. May our hope not be in politics or technology or money or economics or education. May our hope not be in a what but in a who and his name is Jesus. God, I pray for anyone that's here that in their present situation that they would be willing to invite you in to be their guide. Because no matter where we've been or where we're at, if you are a part of our lives, we can become the me that we were meant to be because of Jesus. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.